And thanks everyone for joining us today for the closing session of PTC 21. We have today a, a very distinguished panel of consultants. Uh, you may have been watching researchers uh, during the uh, past four days, but today we have people who actually do research and do thinking for a living and are in the private sector. They include uh, Matt Bramson, who's with Cloud Strategy, Benoit Felton, who is uh, the founder of Diffraction Analysis, Daniel Hayes with Strategy and, and Mark Lutkowitz with Fiber Reality. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. And uh, just to kick things off, I'd like to ask each of you where you see 5G revenue opportunities. Dan, why don't you start? Sure, thanks Gary and uh, aloha everyone. Uh, really excited to be here today. So, you know, 5G revenue opportunities is probably the number one question that we get uh, as, as we engage with clients from all over the world. And that's whether they're carriers, equipment, suppliers, systems integrators, you name it. Um, I, I think the way that I would summarize it is 5G you really have to look at along two, two segments, consumer and enterprise. On the consumer side, many of the opportunities are very uh, similar to what we have today on, on 4G. They are, you know, hopefully some ARPU uplift. There are the potential for additional connected devices, particularly wearables and IoT devices. Um, and then you'll see some organizations getting into more value-added services that will take advantage of 5G's latent, you know, reduced latency and, uh, uh, and higher speeds. Uh, the ones that really interest me, though, are on the enterprise side. Uh, we're seeing a lot more opportunities when it comes to 5G in the enterprise, um, given that a lot of the business cases for investing in 5G just make a lot more sense on the enterprise. Um, so we see things like automation in factories and warehouses as having a really strong return on investment. Uh, we also see, quite frankly, a lot of opportunities in enhanced customer experience. If you're a retailer, having the, the virtual mirror, or if you're a restaurant, having the immersive interactive menu where you get a sense of the chef preparing the dishes and things like that. These are things that 5G stands to make possible. Uh, and, and we think that there's going to be opportunity, not just for the carriers, but also for everyone that's in that stack of creating and developing those solutions, including, quite frankly, those who, who develop and deploy private networks, uh, you know, let alone just public networks. 5G is not just for the carriers anymore. Matt, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would, I would generally agree. Um, I, I'm going to hedge a little bit and say that um, one of the things that I think uh, you know 5G is good for, so to speak, um, is that periodically the telecom industry needs something big and buzzworthy to drive interaction between uh, their their customers, both on the consumer enterprise side and uh, and their sales and product people. They, Businesses are, are, are focused on, you know, their day to day, you know, growing their business, winning and keeping customers. And they need a reason occasionally to pick up their heads and, and go, you know, maybe it's time that we invited our, our telecom carriers in to talk about the implications of, of X. And the more the media can propel that and the more the companies themselves can propel that as a, a big opportunity, it just starts conversations. Maybe you don't end up buying anything that involves 5G, maybe... Uh, may, but maybe they do find opportunities within the business uh, that can be improved uh, with with their technology. So um, it's it's kind of the uh, you know flavor of the month right now. And but it has a, a useful purpose. Uh, and it's I think the industry kind of uh, maybe subconsciously coalesces around some of these buzzwords periodically because they see it as a way to to drive a lot of interaction. Uh, ben, well, I'm guessing you have some questions. Uh or uh, fears perhaps about 5G revenues? Oh, fears, I don't know. I don't fear it. Uh, I think some of the telcos uh, maybe delude themselves. I, I think, I mean, on the enterprise side, uh, I, I do think there are some uh, relatively short-term applications. I'm not convinced today that that is a revenue opportunity for telcos, as Dan mentioned. 
primarily, but it's clear that there are some rep revenue opportunities. That said, you don't deploy a national network on the basis of a national spectrum that you bought for a whole lot of money uh, just for enterprise or just for small verticals within enterprise. So the real question to me is not so much revenue opportunity as business model. And uh, here, I think the only business model that has proven today in certain circumstances to be profitable is fixed wireless access. And that tends to be in markets where the fixed products are not very good today. So the opportunity is more an opportunity of market capture than actually of technology improvement. So what you are going to deliver in terms of service is not necessarily better than a good broadband service today, but you are going to deliver it in a market where that good service doesn't exist. So that's why we're seeing this in Australia in certain parts. That's why we're seeing this, this in parts of the US. Um, and, uh, and these things are not universal by, by any stretch of the imagination. So it's not a silver bullet. Uh, as someone who looks primarily uh, into fixed broadband as a, as a day job uh, in moonlights and 5G on the side, um, you know, it's, it's quite clear to me that, that this is not a substitute for uh, heavy duty fixed deployment in most cases, but there is a working business case with fixed wireless access. So, Mark, the, uh, the question originally is uh, 5G revenue upside. On the other hand, you and I have sort of discussed the existential nature of 5G. How do you see matters? Well, uh, I guess I'm the real contrarian that uh, I don't believe a build it and they will come model is going to work. And that's basically what we have. I think it's fair to say with, the, uh, with 2G up to 4G, there are definite uh, business apps in mind. And I think 5G at the end of the day, um, you know, the United States and Australia were mentioned, it's really about enabling the millimeter wave. And what that does is allow uh, an internal uh, operations platform to happen, whereby you're downloading all this capacity to, to subscribers uh, in concert with DSS and carrier aggregation. And so, Ultimately, the business case uh, for 5G uh, is about uh, staying alive. It's about ensuring a quality of service for all the subscribers. And I think that's what it'll be about for everybody, but it's gonna take a, a, a long time for it, for that millimeter wave to be enabled across the world. And, and just so we, we don't uh, leave our discussion without getting into Wi-Fi 6, what do you guys think about that in terms of um, the value to service providers? Obviously, it's going to be important for enterprises and, and consumers because Wi-Fi is crucial for those groups. But uh, is Wi-Fi 6 the kind of thing that helps service providers, probably is neutral or possibly even hurts them? I don't know. We've heard about monetizing Wi-Fi on the service provider side for like more than two decades, and it still hasn't happened. I, I don't see anything in Wi-Fi 6 that would change that. I'd say they've already monetized it. They, they've they uh, they've managed to offload 80 or 90% of their traffic onto Wi-Fi and haven't had to build the, the capacity to do it. I, I would see Wi-Fi 6 as being a bit more of the same, uh, that it's going to be complementary, it's going to be offload uh, you know, for, for traffic that might otherwise flow onto cellular. But yeah, I think I, and I'm saying that a little bit tongue in cheek, Benoit, but I, I think what you're really saying is, you know, they haven't been able to generate meaningful additional revenue streams from it, which I think will probably continue to be the case. Uh, Matt, I know in your uh, consulting practice, you often have a methodology about advising clients on what they actually have to know about any advanced technology. Um, Typically, what do they need to know when, and why do they need to know? Sure. Well, um, it sounds very, you know, very, very trite and common sense. But what I find uh, is often the the uh, the perspective that's most needed is 
uh, is from the customer, right? The, they, they need to understand what are the implications of the technology on the people that are using it and paying for it? What, what problems is it solving? What benefits is it bringing? Um, a lot of the folks that lead technology organizations are enamored with technology uh, in, its own, in its own right. And um, what I find uh, is that um, they have developed some elegant solution, but when I you know, press them on exactly what's the value to the customer, how is my life gonna be different or better because I have, I'm using your service, um, uh, you know, they, they struggle. Uh, sometimes they get frustrated with me uh, that I'm asking the wrong questions. And that the, um, I, I often say that the, the, whoever the person is who invented the phrase, uh, when you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Uh, that person has done a grave disservice to uh, entrepreneurs uh, because they've convinced them that, that that's actually how the world works. That if you build something that uh, is a better mousetrap, uh, that you know customers will just appear at your door and it, it doesn't work that way. So that would be the number one thing is you know, really understand and, and not just from your own perspective, but ask customers, ask potential customers, um, you know, uh, you know, would you pay for this? Would this be a benefit to you? Would this make an, uh, improve your life in some meaningful way? Um, and, you know, that's your product. Uh, you know, you know, when you start getting, you know, positive answers, encouraging answers, uh, that's, you know, that's when you're onto something. And I think, I think Wi-Fi six. Um, I think it has the potential to, um, uh, you know, you know, enable the management of of lots of endpoints, lots of IoT devices throughout the home. I think there's been a lot of talk about providers um, you know, taking advantage of that and offering various types of of services and management platforms and analytics around all that. Um, it's you know it's to be seen whether whether they will actually you know move on that or whether they'll just be happy to add a two or three dollar per month charge to your monthly bill for you know your refrigerator and your toaster and your dishwasher and 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 stay out of the rest of that. Um, that's my guess is that they'll see it just as a kind of a little bit of a revenue uplift and save the the hard stuff the productization of it to other people. So Dan, that, uh, you, you probably have been following the, uh, I'm sorry, who, who was going to speak up? It's fine. Okay. Um, you can't go to your newsfeed without seeing people warning that this uh, mid-band C-band auction, which is probably going to require CapEx somewhere in the range of, you know, 81 to 91, 92 billion dollars, is kind of scaring people because people remember 3G. Uh, is there a danger here? How do you see things? Oh, well, the, the danger is right in front of us. I think the, the current number, you know, once you factor in the, uh, the potential uh, accelerated delivery premiums is gonna probably be closer to $100 billion for the industry. And uh, danger is all around us. Uh, the reality is that if you look at the capital structure, the balance sheets of our major U.S. mobile network operators, uh, they're not in great shape. Uh, and, you know, spending this amount of capital for something that is, as others have commented here, you know, may not present a, uh, an uplift in revenue, at, let alone profit, is, uh, is dangerous. Now, we look at a lot of this, both the spectrum buys and the infrastructure deployment as effectively maintenance capital. It's what's required on an annual basis to continue to you know, operate and deliver your services. But I think that the, the struggle with the C-band auction that's you know, in the final stages right now is really that it's such large numbers, right? More than double the amount of any prior spectrum auction in the United States that it, it may well put the balance sheets of some of our mobile network operators in, in grave danger. Uh, now, we don't know who's winning yet or you know, winning, and maybe it's the winner's curse and they're really losing, but yeah, it is a significant challenge. And you know, I, I've been personally very vocal and, and skeptical about the carrier's ability to do this. Uh, in fact, when you look around the world, some markets have adopted a general policy of not auctioning spectrum and more or less granting it 
to their mobile network operators, much like we used to do in the United States with television or radio licenses. Um, you know, our, our Treasury Department decided that this was a rich source of, of funds for, for the government, uh, which has been great, but there, there comes a point where it may not be rational. So Ben, well, there may be uh, implications for regulators and, and all kinds of other folks out there, market structure, are there any issues there? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, as frightening as these amounts may be, um, they're, they're only part of the story because um, as Mark was saying earlier, a millimeter wave uh, is going to be the, the, the game changer if there is one in 5G. And that's only going to happen with a huge amount of fiber backhaul, which very few players actually have. So either you factor in the cost of deploying that on top of your spectrum acquisitions and all the rest, and then that makes it even worse in terms of the amount of revenue you have to put on the other side to, uh, to offset this. Or you look at a more systemic solution, which is what, for example, South Korea did by forcing KT, who had those fiber assets, to open them up on a wholesale basis to all of the other players in the market in order to avoid an inevitable uh, shrink in the number of players in the market otherwise. Because if one player can or takes the risk of deploying 5G, they are gonna capture a significant portion of the market and competition is gonna be significantly harmed. Um, so I think, I think uh, policymakers and regulators should treat this very, very seriously um, because the risk is that we're, we're going back towards at the very best, you know, strong oligopolies, if not monopolies, unless we can tackle this. What do you think about that, Mark? Oligopoly in our future? Yes, yes. Uh, first, uh, unfortunately, and uh, as, as, as one who believes in free markets, uh, uh, I hate the idea, but uh, I think at the end of the day uh, that uh, we will have one operator per nation. It'll be uh, some kind of back to the future thing where it'll be a kind of a utility and because that is the only way uh, that, the, that, that an operator will be able to afford uh, the, the expense. And uh, I think it'll be uh, somewhat analogous to the railroads in Europe uh, with the exception of the UK, who I, who I, uh, which I understand has very lousy railroads, but, uh, uh, but uh, basically uh, Europe, uh, you know, they have these state run railroads and a lot of it just has to do with uh, the, the cost overruns. But Gary, I know, I know you're the moderator, but I, I know you wrote an article that maybe the expense on this uh, spectrum is not as big as it seems if you take into account the capacity. Am I correct about that? That's absolutely correct. I, I'd argue actually that the 5G spending on a sort of, um, you know, capacity per potential user is actually quite low. Right. It's just that there's so much of it. <laughs> so it's like volume purchasing. Right. But I, but I do agree that, that, that uh, the fiber support is uh, really important. And I think Verizon did it the right way by getting that out of the way up front or getting a lot of it out of the way up front. And I think all this excitement about T-Mobile because it just has uh, you know, a lot more spectrum is going to be in trouble in the long term because they won't have that fiber support when they do need to transition to millimeter wave. Uh, but, but I can't resist uh, asking Matt about uh, uh, his uh, build, uh, uh, better mousetrap. I mean, Apple has made a good living on building a better mousetrap. What do you say to that, Matt? Um, well, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's probably my, I would say, the second greatest sin is every entrepreneur <laughs> thinks, they're, thinks they're Steve Jobs and uh, thinks that they should not listen to the market. They should listen to their, to their, their soul or something. And... Uh, um, I would say it's a good counterexample, but it's also potentially a, 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 a terrifying one to think you're going to emulate. I well, would also argue that Apple's success is not just the product. It's a whole lot of other things around the product. Um, yep, I would agree. I would agree. It was, you know, uh, capitalizing on the idea of creating the ultimate technological experience uh, in whatever platform. And and, you know, I don't know that any other company ha has taken that sort of an audacious uh, approach to the, to the market. They've focused on point solutions for certain things, but not 
thinking sort of holistically about how to how to provide uh, an ultimate experience and not worry about categories like hardware and software and marketplaces and and uh, and just you know think about how do we you know what would we have to do to create the the best experience and not be not be deterred by where that you know where that leads you i think that that was pretty revolutionary it does raise another issue about uh, where revenue is in the 5g ecosystem is the 5g ecosystem part of something bigger i mean who stands to gain uh can service providers uh expect to gain very much in terms of incremental revenue or you know, ARPU implications, that sort of thing. Uh, I think one could argue that there's not a lot of upside for most mobile service providers uh, beyond some enterprise revenue. Well, and even I, that, I would I generally mean, agree with that. I would say that you know, if you look at the average household spending on uh, service providers, you know, providing them with bandwidth into their home and bandwidth into their devices. Um, I can't imagine that there's a, you know, I think most people are in the couple hundred dollars uh, or more, you know, range for their household. I, I can't imagine there's a much appetite to go much beyond that unless you're really bringing, you know, you know, tremendous incremental value. Just a little bit faster is not going to make me want to spend another hundred or two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. I, I it, it's interesting you should say that because just this week I saw. A, a slide circulate, which I believe comes from some uh, analyst presentation from uh, the satellite uh, companies uh, saying that, you know, we can deliver twice the speed for 30% more and customers like 50% of customers say that's a great deal. And I wanted to say, oh man, have I seen those slides in the past? And, and that's a wall you're going to crash into really, really fast. Um, it's just not going to happen. I mean, people might say that when they're surveyed because they're pissed off with their service provider, pardon my French, but, um, but when it comes time to actually switch over, that's just not going to happen. If you deliver 10 times the speed, you might have a market opportunity, but if you deliver twice the speed, it's just not worth 30% more to virtually anyone. Yeah, ben Benoit, we actually conducted two rounds of uh, large scale consumer research on this, on this very topic when it comes to 5G. And, and there were a couple of interesting findings. You know, if, uh, just to give you a sense, fully two thirds of people basically said they would pay nothing more, right? And that makes it very difficult to charge anything, something more. Um, and on average, when you looked at it, there was, a, there was an uplift of, let, let's call it, eight to 10 percent that was possible but really dragged down by that that segment of the population the the struggle as as we see it is the industry has really done a poor job of educating consumers on the value uh, of 5g what could it do for them that would cause them to pay more and when you when you add to that uh, many of the benefits of 5G, take latency as perhaps the best example, are completely not understood by the average person, right? What does that really mean? You know, what do I get for it? So the way we've been thinking about it is if, if carriers are going to get any value out of 5G, it really is going to have to come from clearer conveyance of the value proposition and potentially alternative models where you look at it, right, I want to go play a uh, virtual interactive game. Maybe I can turbocharge my session for the next hour to do yeah. that for a couple of bucks or something like that, right? I, I know my kids would probably pull out their own wallets and, and, and do it. So there are things like that that really we're going to have to think out of the box as to how we monetize this. Uh, it's unlikely to, to, to echo your point, it's unlikely to be just the same old monthly recurring charge kind of model that gets us there. Yeah, there's a point also that, I mean, there's this whole idea about a 5G race and, and you know, countries competing against each other. And, and I think that's, again, part of my French bull. Um, most countries have nothing to lose in being like six months or a year late into that particular bandwagon. Um, and, and maybe only a few have the actual, you know, industrial uh um economy and export economy to actually leverage being early on this 
and that might be South Korea and China and maybe Japan. Uh, but for the most part, I, I don't think you are going to have a negative economic impact because you're doing 5G two years later than anybody else. Yeah, just to back up that point, basically, uh, you know, Verizon early in the year or earlier last year uh, uh, was having a spectral uh, capacity problem, a spectrum capacity problem, which I, the industry seems to have developed amnesia about. And I think that's one of the reasons why they may have been a little bit more aggressive, but, you know, they tend to be more innovative on networking as, as uh, operators go. But uh, again, it's uh, when, it, when it's about survival, uh, it's, the, it's a catch-22 in, in the sense that uh, maybe, in fact, I remember the CEO of Verizon being quoted in the Wall Street Journal saying, we would have done 5G regardless of, of uh, return on investment. And, and, I, and I believe that. So if it's a question of survival and you don't get all the money back, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. And maybe that's why you do wind up with one operator at the end of the day. Uh, I, I do know that the at and network uh, planners are just pulling their hair out because they just don't have the funds and resources to get to uh, enabling millimeter wave. And uh, they, they know how problematic that is. Uh, but I do want to ask Benoit, I mean, I, do you think uh, that this fixed wireless access to, uh, to residents is going to be, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Verizon was uh, playing that up big time at the beginning. They, 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 you know, they, they, they moved away from it. Do you think that's going to be a big uh, service for the 5G operators? Big, I don't know. I think it's going to be localized, efficient, you know, effective locally. Uh, it opens up competitive opportunities. If you're a pure mobile player, that's an, an opportunity to go and get extra revenue from eating up the fixed lunch from your competitors. That I absolutely think is going to happen, especially in uh, the developing world where, uh, where there's much more of an opportunity because fixed services are lousy or non-existent. Um, but uh, as I said at the beginning, it's, it is not going to be a silver bullet to uh, blanket coverage or, or anything like that because you know the costs are quite considerable anyway, and it might be comparatively cheaper than deploying fiber, but it's not a tenth of deploying fiber or not even half of deploying fiber. It's maybe three quarters of deploying fiber. So you still have a big, a pretty big issue around that. And if you couldn't justify deploying fiber in the first place, there's a good chance that uh, to a large part of that same territory, you will not be able to justify deploying fixed wireless access anyway. I always like to look at uh, fixed wireless as sort of a, can I shift two points of market share kind of a business value because if I'm a, a big service provider like T-Mobile and I have zero share of the home broadband market and I think I can use fixed wireless to grab two points to share it's a pretty big market and it's all gravy you have zero yeah. coming from that now mm -hmm. so it yeah. doesn't have to replace fiber to the home it simply has to be able to shift a couple points of market share yeah but it's all down especially to if you have a bunch of customers that, that you just have to you know send a promotion to it's not like you're you know have to have a tremendous sales effort Right. Yeah, but it's down to how much is it going to cost you to do that. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, gentlemen, if I am not mistaken, we are down to our last 30 seconds or so. I uh, might ask you any concluding comments for us. I just uh, want to well, thank you for, for, I just want to, you know, please to be a part of this. Thank you, Gary. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously. And, uh, you know, this is going to be an ongoing story for a, a while. So I'm pretty sure we're going to meet again and talk about this again. Oh, only let's do it in Honolulu next time. Absolutely. Definitely. Amen. Agreed. Lunch will be on me. Agreed. That sounds great. And Dan, thanks so much for joining us. I, people don't know this, but uh, I've been working with Dan off and on for, I think, 25 years. In fact, it was so long ago that I last interviewed him, I couldn't even remember what publication it was for. Both of us were much younger then, I can tell you. That's right. That's right. Thanks so much, Gary.